Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to another Sharewise webinar. My name is Harry McCaskill, and today uh, we're lucky enough to uh, have a couple of gentlemen over at uh, Kena Bank presenting for us and, you know, uh, having a bit of a Q&A with, with everyone listening. So I'm excited, and I'm sure they are as well. I know uh, some of you would already know KSL, Kena Securities. Uh, they were established in 1985, um, and now they're in Papua New Guinea. They're one of, well, their second largest bank and financial services company, which is really, really exciting. Now, they offer a multitude of, of avenues and customer end-to-end -end financial solutions from savings uh, to business loans, investments and mortgages, and you have financial advice to investment management as well, which is also exciting. Um, now, they're the largest wealth management business in Papua New Guinea. Uh, with more than 8 billion Papua New Guinea and Kina uh, under management. And it's the second largest, well, sorry, it's the company's largest fund administrator, um, which accounts for, I think it's behalf, on behalf of uh, 850,000 800, beneficiaries, which is very, very exciting as well. Now, today we've got Greg and Johnson um, going to go through a few slides with us. Uh, I'll, go, I'll, I'll turn through the, the, the post or well, the presentation on my end, uh, and then there'll be a Q&A at the end as well. Now, uh, I'll, let the, I'll let the two gentlemen here take it away, but thank you for your time today, uh, and I'm looking forward to it. Great, thanks, Harry. And, and look, thanks to uh, the Shearwise team and yourself for the opportunity to um, give uh, KSL a little bit of visibility. Uh, to everyone online, thanks for joining us today. Uh, as Harry said, with me in Port Moresby, very sunny and warm, I might add, compared to <laughs> Australia at the moment, I think. Yeah, I just um, that slide earlier and it's absolutely freezing in Sydney. So it's a little bit better over there. I'm glad I'm here. Um, <laughs> so with me is Johnson Carlo, our Chief Financial Officer, and Kevin O'Connor has mm -hmm. actually joined us online. He's our Investor Relations Advisor based in, in Sydney. Now, I've got a few, few slides to run through. I'm not going to talk to every single one, but we thought it was important just to tell you uh, about the story of uh, Kina, our products and services, what we do, our market positioning, and probably most importantly for you, for those of you online that don't know much about PNG, a little bit about the economy uh, and the key drivers of, of economic growth moving forward, which we hope to benefit from. Um, the financial data I'm sharing is actually from our uh, FY 2023 results pack, and you can access that online via our website. Just click on the investor tab. Um, and once I'm finished, as Harry said, uh, happy to open up for, for a, for a Q&A. So look, to begin with, um, Harry, slides two, three, and four, if you just glide us through those wow. as I'm talking. Um, Harry's stolen a bit of my thunder here, but we were established in 85, a privately owned finance company, and we were actually the first independent superannuation fund administrator and licensed investment manager in PNG. Uh, in 2015, um, that all changed. Kina listed on the ASX and the local exchange, PNGX, and raised 140 million AUD to acquire Maybank's commercial banking license and operation of PNG. Uh, for those of you that don't know, Maybank is one of the big five commercial banks in Malaysia and was exiting PNG. It had a small customer base at the time of around 20,000, and only two very small branches in Port Moresby, which is the capital, not dissimilar to... to um, Canberra's representation in Australia, and Lay, which is the, the largest commercial centre. In 2018, Kina completed the acquisition of ANZ Bank's retail, SME, and commercial businesses here in PNG, and that enabled us to become effectively a full-service commercial bank. The divestment by ANZ was consistent with their broader Southeast Asia strategy. Today in PNG, they still operate here, and they have a, a corporate customer base of around 500 largely Australian multinationals operating in the country and predominantly in the resources sector. So the acquisition for us included 17 branches and gave Kina a national footprint in most of the major provincial locations across the country. Asian Development Bank, uh, headquartered out of Manila in the Philippines, are our third largest shareholder. And I just wanted to call them out because as a, a AAA investment grade organisation, they have and continue to provide us with a great level of technical support, particularly with respect to ESG and our international trade services, which gives us credibility, obviously, when we're dealing with organisations based offshore. So since 2018, uh, we've grown our market share from 11 to 18%. We're now the second largest retail bank in the country, with deposits and loans actually exceeding both Westpac and ANZ combined. The largest commercial bank in the country, for context, is Bank of South Pacific, 
They merged with BPNG Banking Corporation during the GFC. They've got a dominant market share position as a result of that of around 65%, and that's partially bolstered by being the primary banker to the sovereign, the government. As Kina has consistently demonstrated, though, this presents for us an enviable organic growth opportunity, particularly in the retail and, and moreover, the growing middle class demographic here in PNG, but also for business, the SME and commercial sectors, which are predominantly our sweet spot. Corporate for Kina is more advisory and transactional and, and relates specifically to FX supply, which I'll talk a little bit about shortly. So the bank to make a model, uh, bank to market maker model, which is really the core of our strategy, and Harry, that's on slide five, um, demonstrates uh, a few things that I, I wanted to talk to. Unlike Australia, the banking sector in PNG is self-funding with a high level of domestic liquidity and therefore um, translating into a very low cost of funds. In fact, at the moment, that's just under 1%. We also enjoy a very healthy net interest margin of 7% on, on our loan book, which I think would be the envy of all of the Australian banking sector. <clears throat> and there are principally five key drivers of revenue for the company, um, which I did want to call out across net interest, net interest income from loans and deposits and non-interest income consisting of investments. And those are predominantly in government secur securities and treasury bills, foreign exchange earnings, our digital channels, where we've actually grown revenues from a zero base to over 80 million Kina in the past three years, and Kina Investment and Superannuation Services, which is a funds administration business, and Kina Funds Management. We're one of three licensed investment managers in the country and have about a 60% share in that market. So non-interest income for us represents about 50% of our total revenue, and that's in, in accordance with the, the slide you can see there, the bank to market mate make a diversification strategy that we have. Now, the wonderful advantage of that, of course, that those revenue lines are capital light. The key regulators for us in uh, PNG include the Bank of Papua New Guinea uh, and the Securities Commission, both of whom are efficient and effective. PNG has been independent since 1975, and it's the, Australia's second largest donor with an annual budget exceeding half a billion AUD, second only to Indonesia, in fact. We have firmly established ourselves as PNG's leading digital bank, and together with a number of other strategic partners, as outlined on the slide, um, all designed to extend our overall market reach beyond just the Kina Bank. Over 75% of our retail and business customers now transact with us digitally. In terms of customer growth, and Harry, this is slides uh, six, eight, and nine, at this point, we're touching over 700,000 Papua New Guineans, including Kina and the partnership that we have with the country's leading microfinance bank, MyBank. Our bill pay payments platform, PayBetter, is the VPay of PNG. And earliest, earliest this year, we launched DigiBanker, which is our EKYC or Know Your Customer origination platform. That's accessible by mobile and online, and it enables customers to open and activate their own accounts without any human intervention. Our launch of Exchange, modelled off global payments companies Wise and Revolut, is imminent. These are firsts for PNG, and these platforms will also be extended to the major superannuation funds in PNG with a white label proposition for their members. It's important, I think, to point out that essentially through Kina Investment and Superannuation Services and Kina Funds Management, um, we have access to over 850,000 members um, that are contributing to those, those funds. We're the leading licensed investment manager in the country and for the largest super fund, number one super. And this is a, a key strategic point of differentiation for us as opposed to our competitors. None of our competitors have access to that data or the extent of the strategic relationships that we have with those organisations. And as a function of that, we've been growing our market share in loans and deposits at twice twice the growth of system since the ANZ acquisition. And we're forecasting uh, around 10 billion Kina in footings, that's loans and deposits by the end of 2026. Just looking at the financials and strategic priorities, um, Harry, that slides 10, 11, 12, and 13. Our compound annual growth rate has been consistently around 20% before and post the ANZ acquisition. Our aim is for this to transla translate to growth in revenue. 
and a reduction in our cost to income by achieving a positive jaws. That is higher revenue growth than expenses. And pleasingly, we are at that tipping point this financial year. Our strategic plan is centered around five key priorities, growth of customers, footings and transaction volumes, uh, resilience by adopting the world's best practices in risk management and governance, service and operational excellence by being digital as an organization from the inside out, attracting the best talent in PNG through a market leading employee value proposition, and finally building sustainable communities. Our first ESG report was actually published in 2022 and has a number of objectives across th three layers, including the environment, inclusiveness, and transparency. And moving forward, this will be adapted to also include SME, green, and agri-financing. In terms of asset quality, slides are 14, 15, and 16, please, Harry. Our loan book is in good shape. We have a, a very conservative risk appetite, which reflects on our asset quality. Industry sector and large exposure risks are regularly, regularly monitored. In fact, we've got a strategic credit committee scheduled tomorrow afternoon. We're not overextended to any one particular sector. PNG is, though, a net importer, and the wholesale and retail sectors are very large, serving, you know, servicing a, an estimated population of over 10 million. Um, our exposure to the resources sector is pri primarily to the supply chains and transactional. And uh, as I mentioned earlier, a major source of foreign currency supply for us. Our net interest margin has two components, the loan book itself, which is around 7%, and that's been relatively stable over the past sort of three to five years, and our investment portfolio, which has been a little more volatile. So yields on investments took a hit a few years back, the government moved the majority of its annual funding offshore. However, pleasingly, again, this trend has reversed this year with more of their onshore borrowing and yields are now heading back, uh, sorry, more of their onshore uh, borrowing being domestic and yields now heading back in the right direction. In fact, last week alone, yields lifted by around 100 basis points. So looking ahead, um, slides 18, 19 and 20, uh, looking ahead, we've established a corporate advisory and private banking team, and we've expanded our regional presence for business banking in advance of a number of major resource projects that are set to commence over the next sort of 12 months to five years. We're also considering a domestic tier two capital hybrid corporate bond. This will be the first of its type in PNG, and we're confident of the demand for around 200 million kina. This will enable us to continue to grow in the foreseeable future leveraging the high levels of domestic liquidity that I've talked about and without, of course, coming back to the market for additional capital. So we're continuing to look at suitable M&A opportunities outside of PNG, providing that they are advantageous in terms of revenue and EPS accretive. Uh, the PNG economy is in reasonably good shape. The real game changer, though, as I've touched on, is that we've got over US, uh, 30 billion US dollars in planned resource projects ExxonMobil, Santos and Totel's Papua LNG, the P Piang LNG extension, Pascal and Pogra, which is now reopened, and of course the Wafi Goldfu joint venture between Harmony Gold and Newmont, formerly Newcrest. So we're very excited uh, about uh, what they're going to do in terms of uh, growth and gross domestic product moving forward, which is actually forecast, I think, to, to reach around 10% in 2026-2027. Uh, in terms of guidance um, and in closing, and this is slides uh, 21 and 22, please, uh, Harry, um, there's two extraordinary items that, that I should raise. Uh, firstly, the corporate tax rate for the banking sector in PNG was increased in 2023 from 30% to 45%. Um, it was positioned at the time as a short-term budget fix, but unfortunately it's rolled into 2024. And at the request of the PNG government treasury, and the PNG Bankers Association, which I actually chair, KPMG has been commissioned to prepare a report on the economic impact and to seek a repeal of this tax rate. Now, the upside here, of course, is that the tax rate's not gonna go up, but hopefully um, through the um, consensus lobbying, lobbying by the, the commercial banks here in PNG, it will it is more unlikely to come down. So we'll keep the market posted on those as updates come through 
but we're hoping um, hopefully to get a, a positive outcome, um, outcome on that over the course of this financial year. The second item is the, the recent customer fraud. Now, we announced this to the ASX in mid-June. Um, it was an isolated incident. It involved a small group of customers. And while a provision of um, 12 to 15 million Kina was made as a worst case scenario, the recovery action is well underway. We expect this to come from third party liability action insurance. We're insured for these types of events. And of course, the perpetrators themselves. Um, we are well advanced with these proceedings. And it's important to note that there was no exposure to our core infrastructure and the event was in no way cyber related. Regardless of these two factors, um, our forecast guidance for this year is solid. And <clears throat> we're certainly very excited about our continued future prospects. So Harry, I'll leave it there um, and, and open up for any questions that uh, those online might have. And thanks again, everyone for joining us. I think that's, uh, I think that's a great spot to leave it. And um, I think I forgot to mention at the start, but if anyone does have any questions, put them in the chat and we'll go through them. I'll stop sharing my screen, screen here um, and we'll come back. Perfect. There we are. We're all back. So we did have one question come through um, regarding the, you know, the customer fraud incident. Um, is there, Can you elaborate a little bit more on what exactly happened or you can't go into too many details? Because um, I'm sure well, there's a shareholders that are probably wondering and, you know, potential shareholders wondering what actually happened there. Yeah, thanks, um, Harry. So not, look, no, we can't disclose too much other than it related to an independent piece of technology, an API that we developed in conjunction with our strategic partner, um, MyBank. Our control environment, what, we, what our control environment, I should say, uh, was pretty solid, but unfortunately, on a number of occasions, it hadn't been acted on. So we've got um, a number of external um, uh, firms helping us to understand why that didn't occur. We, we actually yeah. know why it didn't occur, but yeah. how we prevent that from happening moving forward. We've also tested our broader environment to make sure that there's no additional vulnerabilities. Um, it's just one of those annoying things, uh, unfortunately. We're pretty confident on the recovery and certainly there'll be fur further updates over the course of the second half of this calendar year yeah. as that proceeds. But the other important factor, though, that I would raise is, you know, in terms of being classified as material, had this rolled into the second half, it wouldn't have been, yeah. and, and probably been disclosable either, because it would have represent, represented, you know, well less than 5% of our um, forecast earnings for the year. Yeah, um, so, yeah, that's where we're at. Okay, yeah, nice. Obviously, something you're, you're trying to get uh, on top of and fix up on, uh, behind the scenes. I, I remember reading... Uh, I have been following you guys for a while now. I remember seeing that you were looking to buy assets um, in in Fiji. So is, is you know is offshore mergers and acquisitions is that still on the cards? Is that something you're still exploring? Yeah, I touched that on it in the presentation, and it certainly is. Um, we've had for those of you that have followed us for a while, you'd know we've, we've had a couple of bites at Westpac. The first was to buy both their PNG and Fiji businesses. Um, that wasn't our preference, and we knew we'd have some challenges getting the local I, IEEC to to approve that. Um, you know, an Australian bank leaving P, with, with an Australian bank that was the first bank in PNG leaving is not a good look. So it did get some political resistance that we anticipated. But Fiji is a market um, in, in accordance with our Pan Pacific aspirations that we would like to go to for, for a number of reasons. I think the first is. Um, the, the commercial opportunity. There's a couple of organizations there that we think we could add some real value to in terms of growth. It's yeah. clearly a much smaller market than PNG, but probably the most important factor is um, Fiji is on the Southern Cross cable. They have a, a great uh, talent pool of very well-skilled um, software engineers and, and tech heads, which we think would be of considerable value to our organization. Um, yeah. We have a, a a, a pool of talent. We've got to bring people in from outside of the organisation, uh, outside of the country, which comes at an additional cost. So we think there's an opportunity to set up a, a technology hub and some of our core sort of operations that we have here in PNG um, could be done in a more cost-effective way in Fiji. Yeah. Um, so th those are the sort of three primary reasons why why we've been looking at it, and and those discussions are ongoing, but we're still keen to to get there one day. Yeah, excellent, excellent. Because there's a uh, yeah, there's a lot of opportunities obviously over there for you guys, and 
Um, it's just a good way to grow the business, to be honest with you. And uh, we've got a couple coming through. We've got Niv um, has said revenue mixed in PG, PNG. Uh, they focus more on trade and execution uh, or IPOs. Uh, questions, I don't really understand the question here. Revenue mix in PNG, they focused more on trade. I think it just made a statement. There's not really much happening there. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> um, there's one coming in. Uh, what's Kena Bank's foreign exchange exposure um, and how do you make money out of the foreign exchange markets? So the foreign exchange market here is very simple. 95% of the market is spot trade. And um, we're heavily reliant on the resources sector for supply. US dollars, there's been some constraints um, for some time around available um, supply of US dollars to meet the import demand. And that's always been a challenge. But the pleasing thing uh, around that is the central bank itself is doing um, far more frequent market interventions. And um, the, um, the, the actual stock of US dollars that they're holding at the moment is the highest it's been for a long time. Um, we make money off the margin, off the spot trades, but I'll yeah. probably hand to the CFO, who's the, the expert in, in that area, to explain that in a little bit more detail. All right, excellent. <laughs> yeah, no, no, it's exactly as, um, as Greg says, it is only a spot trading market at this point. Um, most, or uh, I think all the banks uh, don't carry the um, FX lending or FX um, liabilities. There are quite strong um, prudential regulations as to the exposures that we can have. We're limited to about 15% of our capital base in terms of assets and liabilities in foreign currencies. Um, <clears throat> for us ourselves, at the end of full year 23, we were about 5% of our capital base in FX exposures. And most of that, or all of that is just um, interbank positions just to support our spot trading with our correspondent banking. Yeah. So is that is there a shortage of foreign exchange or it's just the basis that it's still developing? Oh, look, it's a, a big historical issue. So so the, the structural challenge you've got in PNG is the main sources of foreign currency, and it's predominantly USD. We don't have the same issues with, with other currencies, including AUD. For that matter, it's predominantly US dollars, and, and the main reason for it is that the major resource companies that are exporting LNG, gold, copper. Bearing in mind, you know, PNG has a, a wealth of natural resources. They're yeah. not bringing currency back into the country because they don't need to. They yeah. only need to bring sufficient back to run their operations. So yeah. that caused a, a gap between the supply. That, that's sourced coming back into the country versus the supply from importers because PNG is still a net importer despite yeah. having a very big and active resources sector, um, which causes the issue. And it just means that if you are a business, you put in uh, an order for foreign currency, if it's US, US dollars, you could wait probably four to six weeks on average for that order to be fulfilled. Right. At the moment, that's actually a little bit faster. In fact, some orders are being completed on the spot. Um, that's the only sort of, I think, structural dynamic that's a little different to, to what you would experience in Australia. Okay, okay. Now, we've got another one coming in. Simon, he said, could you please provide more detail on asset quality trends? Yeah, sure. I'll, I'll give that nice one to, to Johnson. Yeah, um, our asset quality, I'll just start with a couple of metrics. Our provisions to... Um, gross loans at the end of full year 23 was about 2.4%, 2.3%, which is um, quite strong for this market. I think we were the lowest um, between us and our largest competitor, BS, BSP. Um, we enjoyed the lower capital, <clears throat> uh, lower provisions to loan ratios. And also our NPL percentage uh, which is a measure of our arrears against our gross uh, loans was uh, much, much lower than our our benchmark of 10%. I think we sat at 8%. And those trends have sort of continued into uh, into this year. So, um, you know, whilst we're an emerging market we and we would have a different range of risks um, and asset risks to deal with here, um, relative to our competitors, we sit very well uh, in PNG. Okay, 
Excellent. I think that answers the question very, very nicely. Um, we did have another one following up regarding the fraud side of, side of things. Uh, Bill wanted to know how much non-disclosure fraud has there been? Oh, virtually zero. <laughs> and the time that I've been with the company, uh, which is seven years, we haven't had any fraud disclosures. Okay. This is the first. Yeah, obviously that gives the, gives the shareholders a little bit of confidence there. Uh, another one, um, we had one come in before the webinar from, from a viewer. Uh, they wanted you to discuss a little bit more and comment on the sovereign risk uh, and, and the impacts that could potentially have moving forward. Um, at the moment, because we're a, a domestic bank, it doesn't really have, um, you know, PNG sovereign risk rate is B2. It's been fairly stable at that level again, over the past several years. Um, one of the, um, the reasons I called out the Asian Development Bank as one of our biggest shareholders, that's really important for us because outside of the sovereign risk grade, they're AAA investment grade. So that yeah. um, makes it considerably easier for us to trade yeah. with um, other offshore banks that wouldn't other not, otherwise trade with us because of the sovereign risk grade. So yeah. that gives us considerable leg up and, you know, they help underwrite our um, trade finance program and, and, as I mentioned, provide a, a great deal of technical, technical support, which we're, we're really grateful for. So it doesn't really um, cause us any great concern. And by virtue, you, you know, the mitigant for us is, is the ADB relationship that we have. Otherwise, it probably would be a bit of a challenge in terms of international trade. But again, given the majority of what we do is, is spot FX, that doesn't really cause us too many concerns in any event. Yeah. Okay. And then with um with the loan the loan book growing at fifteen to twenty percent, we've got a question here. Um, how do you how do you fund the balance sheet? You know, you talked about corporate bonds. Is that uh, is that the way you're going to look at it, or what's what's the plans? So we're we're running a deposit to loan ratio at the moment of about one hundred and fifty percent. We're we're incredibly flush with liquidity, and the central bank's actually doing a lot to try and mop up some of that excess liquidity at the moment. But there's no shortage of cash. A lot of that comes from, obviously, um, from us being the second biggest retail bank, transactional deposits from our yeah. customers, a, a very low cost, sitting in, you know, check and, and low cost savings accounts. Um, we have a wholesale cash management account, which is well supported by the corporate sector. But again, you know, I mentioned at the start of the presentation, I think our cost of funds is sort of hovering around 1% at the moment. It's very, very low. Um, so there's no shortage in terms of funding the loan book. Obviously, the capital size side of it, our capital adequacy at the moment is around 21%. That's relatively high, but not unusual for an emerging market financial services organisation. And the 200 million capital bond that I spoke about is really just a bolster that to help support the forward um, growth aspirations that we've got in the loan book. I mean, we're, we're forecasting along the same lines as 2023 for this year. Obviously, as that book gets bigger, um, that percentage growth will come back a little bit. Uh, yeah. But we just want to explore and make sure that we've got sufficient capital, certainly for of the course. next three to five years to fund that growth. Yeah, 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 I agree. And uh, you've got another one from Simon. Where do you think the cost to, uh, cost to income ratio could settle over time? Noting the reduction from financial year 2022 to 2023, and what will drive this leading, leading, I guess, into the future? Well, the first thing, I'll get Johnson to comment on that because he, he obviously looks after the checkbook. But um, from, from my perspective, um, it's always been a desire to get to a point where our revenue is growing at a faster rate than our operating expenses. Yeah. And I think this year, as I mentioned in the, the presentation, will be the tipping point for that, which is great. So we've got certainly a focus on bringing that cost of income down. Uh, the other other aspect is um, just our, our internal organisational efficiency. So we've got a number of um, internal digitalisation programmes at the moment uh, in the loan origination area to, to digitalise end-to-end, uh, -end, starting with our personal and consumer loan portfolio or home lending, and yep. then a uh, platform at the moment that we're scoping for business lending into 2025. That will help improve um, our operational efficiency considerably. And... As I said earlier, that, that option of potentially um, setting up a, a back office operations and tech hub in Fiji, I think will help also um, bring bring that, that cost of income ratio down. But Johnson, maybe you, you can add to that. Yeah, no, I, I won't add much more. We <clears throat> Obviously, the operational 
cost efficiencies are extremely important and we, and we continue to work towards those where you know we've come from the high 50 <clears throat> high 50 percentage um cost to income ratio we, we've sort of passed through the mid 50s now and our our <clears throat> aspirational goal i suppose would be to get to 50 if we could in the next two or three years um and that's you know we, we're sort of focusing all our energies on that and, and we, we shouldn't forget also that we are you know <clears throat> we do have a revenue um revenue growth uh strategy as well on that not interest income side um we have returns on our securities uh, rising uh yields on our securities rising uh recently as well so on the revenue side things are positive as well uh so i, I think we will um you know keep trending uh, our cost to income ratio downwards um we don't sort of ignore the possibility of bumps and blips uh, blips along the way such as has happened in the earlier part of this year but you know our, our it, as a general direction i think we're going uh, going in the right right way right excellent and we've got two more and i think we can uh, we can call it a day we've got one from stuart um, what is the company's future growth expectations for PNG in the next few years? And what uh, and where are the main sources of offshore capital coming from? I think you've already touched base on that briefly, but we may as well go over it again. But if there was anything you missed? Um, look, I, I think for us, um, and I touched on this again at the opening of the presentation, we're, we're in a pretty good position. You know, we're, we've got, we're ranking second in terms of market share, hovering around 17, 18%. We've been growing, if you look at the business system growth and even uh, consumer system growth, at double that right now for the last sort of five, five years or so. So we got continuing to gain market share. Um, there's a huge gap between us and the biggest bank in the country, which is BSP. Um, and, you know, the Australian banks, one is focused on the corporate sector, so we're not necessarily a direct competitor, certainly in the debt space. Uh, and Westpac, if, if I can say, um, have, have tried to sell out twice to us, yeah. um, don't really have any appetite to be here. So they're a relatively benign competitor. Yeah. Um, so, you know, we, we aim to take advantage of that. We're getting some good growth out of our existing customer base from customers that are doing things, you know, particularly invest in capital to grow their businesses yeah. um, as, as attracting um, customers from ANZ. They've got a, a smaller commercial base. We've got quite a few of their customers um, on our radar screen, uh, Westpac and BSP. And, you know, we, we've had a good start in the first half, consistent with last year, and we're expecting that trend to continue. Um, one of the areas, actually, that we've had some really pleasing growth, um, which we only really switched on in the last two years is regional PNG. So much of our loan growth was coming out of Port Moresby, which, as I mentioned, is, is kind of like a smaller scale ACT in PNG. It's predominantly government and services. Right. Um, we're now getting far more business out of Ley, which is the second biggest city in PNG, and the sort of Melbourne, the, the commercial hub. Yeah. Um, we've got a really good banking team on the ground there. And we've now got qualified and experienced business bankers in most of the major regional centres like Medang, Mount Hagen, uh, Garoka, which is a big coffee um, coffee exporting uh, district. And we're attracting a lot more business in that space, which is great for foreign exchange earnings as well. Yeah. Um, and and WeWAC. So, and, and sorry, Kokopo. So we've got a really good um, uh, footprint now in terms of um, business and commercial uh, across the country and, and those guys are doing a terrific job in terms of you know lending pipeline and growth and that's important for us because when these resource resource projects kick kick off the only connecting road in png is from lay right through to the highlands highway up into mount hagen and the major resource projects and that th those districts are going to go crazy in terms of supply chain when those projects kick off so we're well well i think are uh, well positioned to take advantage of that opportunity when it arises. In the, in the next few years, excellent. And uh, to top it all off, we've got one more. Uh, you're on a cash dividend yield of just over 10%. What is your dividend policy? Yeah, we have a stated policy of maintaining a <clears throat> payout ratio in the 65 to 80% of earnings range. 
um, we try to travel close close to that dividend uh, yield number that you talk about. It's obviously a sensitive balance to uh, to strike, but uh, I think you know if the last several years is any indication, um, I think we do well to to achieve those. Yeah, excellent, excellent. Well, gentlemen, again, I want to thank you both for coming here today and uh, giving us a little bit of a presentation and insight into into Kena. Uh, there's a lot happening by the sounds of it. Sounds like you both are well positioned. Um, you know, Q and A is always good for your shareholders and, and people who are wanting to learn more. So, uh, from 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 Sharewise, I just want to say thank you. I'm one of the senior advisors here. Anyone who has uh, been able to watch it or has missed out, it will be. Um, on our YouTube channel, on our websites. Uh, Greg will get a copy. I'm sure they'll be putting it on their socials as well. So be sure to check that out. Uh, there, if there's anything you missed, yeah, just go rewatch that one and uh, and you'll be all caught up to, to, to date, I guess. Now, um, Greg, is there any last last comments you want to make? No, not at all. Um, just again, thank, thanks everyone for joining. And if you have any, any further questions, don't hesitate to reach out yeah. either via Harry or directly to, to Johnson and myself. Yeah, exactly right. Well, everyone, enjoy enjoy the rest of the day. And um, Greg, thank you again. And Johnson, thank you again. We're good. Thank Cheers. you. Bye, everyone.